Hello, everyone. I'm Andy Serwer, Editor-in-Chief of Yahoo Finance, and welcome to our fourth Election 2020 special presented to you in conjunction with HuffPost and Yahoo News. Tonight, the focus is on Black Lives Matter and the important changes that the movement for social justice has brought to society and this presidential campaign. I'm joined, as I've been each week, by my co-host, Yahoo News Editor-in-Chief Dan Clydman, and HuffPost Washington Bureau Chief Amanda Turkel. Amanda, Dan, welcome. Hey, hey thank you. Amanda, good to see you guys again. <laughs> Missed you. We're getting used to this. Yeah. <laughs> Dan, let me start off with you and ask you how important this issue has been for the campaign. I, I think it's important. I mean, it's been important for the country, um, and it's been important um, in this election campaign on kind of two levels, I would say. First, there's um, uh, the kind of more cosmic level in a sense, um, the question of uh, the impact that the uh, racial justice protests and the focus on all of these issues of inequities um, have had on the way Americans see where we are right now. And, you know, we're in a, uh, a campaign where the incumbent, Donald Trump, uh, wants to be rehired. He doesn't want to be fired. Um, and um, one of the things that uh, everyone looks at um, when, um, when assessing a, an incumbent's chances um, are, are the question of, you know, is the country on the right track or on the wrong track? Um, and um, I think this um, very difficult past few months um, has, I think, suggested to a lot of people that in some fundamental ways we're on the wrong track. Um, and those numbers are borne out. Um, in the polling that we've done and others have done. I mean, I think it's around 65% uh, wrong track as opposed to right track. And I think that's hurt uh, Donald Trump. And then you lay on top of that, you know, the, the pandemic and the economic fallout. And so that's made it uh, very tough. And then very quickly, at the kind of tactical level, um, I think Donald Trump thought that this was going to help him, uh, particularly because he was putting so much of a focus on um, some of the rioting and looting uh, that that we saw, um, and uh, was trying to make a the argument that he would be the law and order um, uh, president. The problem was he, he thought that you know people in the suburbs where elections are really fought out in a lot of ways were going to be really terrified about what was going to happen. Um, and he just doesn't, I think, fundamentally understand who lives in the suburbs these days and what people in the su suburbs care about. And the polling suggests, uh, that uh, a lot of voters who live in the suburbs are very concerned about racial inequities and want to get back to more harmony uh, and less division in this country. Thanks, Dan. And, and Amanda, Dan talked a little bit about how President Trump um, is framing the issue, I guess you could say. How is Joe Biden framing the issue on the other side? And, and how are African-Americans responding? And, and will they vote? And who will they vote for? Well, Joe Biden obviously is embracing uh, the racial equality protest, and he he has hit back and sort of been on the defensive a bit as as Donald Trump is like Joe Biden wants to defund the police. Biden is saying, no, I don't want to defund the police. And I will say that you know Biden has been making far less of an issue of this than Donald Trump has. You know, Donald Trump wants to talk about anything except the coronavirus. And so you saw over the summer that Trump was running quite a few ads about, um, he was running a lot of ads on China, but he was also at running a lot of ads on crime and trying to say that, you know, look, Biden is very extreme. And if you elect him, you will see rioting and looting in your streets and was being quite honestly, sorry, openly racist. I was gonna sneeze there. <laughs> quite honestly, being openly racist, saying that people like Cory Booker, who is obviously a prominent black senator, will come in and um, you know create housing projects and take over the suburbs. You know, black voters obviously aren't um, being won over by Donald Trump, but it seems like that this message isn't working with the sort of white suburban voters that Trump wants to win over as well. And Dan, uh, Amanda just said it's it's probably the case that uh, most African Americans will vote for Joe Biden if they vote. Um, but Donald Trump actually is counting on African Americans to a small degree to support him. 
Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, elections these days uh, tend to be uh, uh, one, in, you know, about the margins, right? And uh, they they have tended to be fairly close, and so a percentage point here or there uh, can make a difference. And you know, I talked to uh, people uh, advising the Trump campaign um, over the last few months, and they have said that they really are, uh, you know, pushing to increase. Um, their support from black voters uh, by a, just a few percentage points, and they think that that uh, would be part of their kind of path to victory. Trump did uh, win about 8% of the uh, of the black vote in 2016, which was an increase from uh, Mitt Romney um, and then and, and John McCain four years before that. A couple of percentage points here, here and there. They wanted to get into the low uh, teens, um, and I, I don't think that is likely to happen. Uh, but it is interesting that um, black men in particular um, have been um, more supportive of, of Trump than I think a lot of people uh, w would realize. And it's an interesting subject. It, it seems counterintuitive. Um, but then again, you know, no group is monolithic. Um, and it's always possible to uh, to get, you know, to go up a little bit or down a little bit um, every election cycle. Amanda, how energized do you think African-American voters are and how important is that for a Biden victory? Uh, we will see. <laughs> I mean, it seems like Democratic African-American voters are very energized and Biden has made the Biden campaign is aware that they need to make sure that these voters are energized in a way that um, in 2016, they weren't. And it seems like many people believe that the Hillary Clinton campaign took these voters for granted. Uh, Biden obviously does have a lot of African-American support. That is how he won in South Carolina and how he became the nominee. Traditionally, he has had more support from older black voters than younger black voters. Uh, but you see the Biden campaign recognizing that this time we can't take the Democratic base for granted. We can't just focus on these other areas. Um, and these other groups. And so they are making an effort to make sure they reach out and they turn out these voters as are outside democratic democratic groups, um, progressive groups doing this as well. So, uh, you know, I think that now Trump isn't just, you know, a possibility and a threat. Trump is real. And I think that's motivating a lot of people on the left. Right. OK. Well, we're going to take a break, but when we come back, we'll be joined by Yahoo News national reporter Marquise Francis to discuss the black vote and voter enthusiasm ahead of the election. Stay tuned.
Welcome back. Joining us now is Yahoo News national reporter Marquise Francis. Marquise, welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. Happy to be here. A lot of your reporting in recent months has been around different ways that the black community has been engaged in this election and how the campaigns, especially the Democratic ones, are trying to engage back. What are you finding? Yeah, well, one thing I'm seeing is uh, the Joe Biden campaign. They're really trying to go where a lot of black voters and a lot of black people are. Uh, we know earlier this year, Joe Biden went on The Breakfast Club, which is a nationally syndicated radio morning show in, located in New York City. And he was interviewed by Charlemagne the God. Unfortunately, on that show, he kind of had the slip at the end where he said, you're not black if you don't vote for me. Um, he's also doing things like they have these panels they're calling Shop Talk, kind of modeled similarly after LeBron's HBO show, The Shop, where they have black voters, particularly prominent black men, sit around in a barbershop type atmosphere, obviously more virtual in these times. And they talk about unfiltered conversation about debates. And I spoke to one of those panelists, uh, rapper Young Jeezy, a few weeks ago, and he talked about why he's engaged. He didn't go as far as saying he would endorse Joe Biden, but he's saying he enjoys that the campaign is actually engaging with him. And this is a lot of the sentiment I'm hearing across the board. Now, all of their tries are not actually going necessarily well with black voters. There was a video, I believe it came out last week, where they had almost, they were simulating a rap battle of sorts, and they were throwing out campaign stats and different things like that. And that didn't really sit well with a lot of black voters, but I heard you all talking in the first block just about black voter participation. And they're really just trying to engage people. We know in 2016, 90, I believe it was 98% of black women voted for Hillary Clinton. But when you look at black men, it was only 81%. So black men are the group in which Biden definitely wants to ensure he kind of has the black vote. And as Dan kind of mentioned, they are not a monolith. And we saw, even though the past few days we saw rapper 50 Cent kind of come out and seemingly, not officially, but seemingly endorse Trump over, uh, you know, Biden's tax plans, which I think a lot of people are kind of misconstruing. But they're, the black vote is important and we're seeing it. And for a lot of black Americans, they just want to know that the things in which a presidential nominee says they will do, they will actually do. Well, Marquise, let's, let's dig into that a little bit, because, um, you know, you also had um, Ice Cube, uh, the uh, former rapper and, and uh, movie star, um, flirt uh, with with Donald Trump, um, and uh, and the numbers are, are are interesting. I mean, as as we talked about before, um, you know, they're still below double digits, um, but they're creeping up a bit. And Trump, who I think it's fair to say is the most racially divisive president we've had since uh, Richard Nixon, or maybe even before, why is he able to attract more black voters? And I'm particularly struck by, uh, as you point out, um, male black voters. I think I saw a number that, um, that he's close to around seven, a 17% approval rate uh, with, um, you know, uh, with, with male black voters. Any thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I see. I saw a tweet, uh, I believe, this week where it said black men are actually more interested in fitting themselves where they fit into the patriarchy instead of actually dismantling it. And I think it just goes to the psyche of black men. We all know as men, we have our own, uh, just our own ways in which we do things and our own biases and even our own uh, liberties at which we can live this world. And for black men, oftentimes, they may see themselves in a likeness of a Donald Trump, where he shows his th strength and authority. I went to five Trump rallies, actually, over the past year and a half. And obviously, the overwhelming majority of people attending these rallies were white men and women. But you definitely saw a handful of black men. And a lot of them had the same sentiments of whether they were super conservative when it came to religion, Donald Trump is a Christian, he doesn't believe in gay rights, and we know the black community, and specifically black men, are tend to be homophobic. Um, but a lot of people tend to latch onto one thing, and they make that the only thing. We talked about 50 Cent just uh, a minute ago, and one of the things that he kind of called out that he was so, he exclaimed was the, the tax bracket which I believe once you make over $400,000, the money after that is taxed at about 60, 65%. Um, so it's, it's really, it seems as though a lot of times black men 
uh, they serve their own interests when they're looking at the, the grand scheme of things. And black women oftentimes are doing and choosing for the collective uh, majority. Marquise, so we talked a little bit um, right now about the gender gap in the black community, but what about the age gap? Obviously, uh, during the primary, Joe Biden got a lot more support from older black voters than younger black voters. Are those voters now coming behind Biden or are they still not really quite as excited about him and, and maybe sitting it out a bit more? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I can't speak for everyone, but from what I understand, I think people are starting to more and more realize the importance of this election. In 2016, I was looking up a stat. Um, for the first time in 20 years, black voter turnout declined. It was at 59.6% compared to a record high in 2012, which was at 66.6, according to a Pew Research poll. And, I, and I've heard from so many people at one point, you know, we don't like Biden, but we definitely don't like Trump. But I think it's becoming more reality. You know, they're having to pick between the lesser of two evils for a lot of uh, people. There are definitely going to be the faction of people who decide not to vote at all. They believe no one's good. It doesn't trickle down to them. But I think with the emergence of so many visuals, whether that mean commercials, we're seeing ads on Facebook, Twitter, people are really starting to realize how important their vote is. And we're seeing even, once again, going back to celebrities, I saw a video of Shaquille O'Neal voting, voting for the first time, and Snoop Dogg. Personally, I have my own issues as a grown man over the 40, 40 years old, you voting for the first time, but they're once again pushing out the need and the importance of voting. We even saw P. Diddy talk about uh, wanting to start a new Black party. So there is just this increased fervor, this increased energy around this vote, everyone's saying to vote. It's almost getting to the point where you're getting shamed if you don't vote. So I, I definitely believe young people understand the importance. From what I understand, most people are just going to say, you know what, we're going to go for Biden, we're going to go for Kamala. Kamala also being an HBCU grad from Howard University in D.C. So there's things that even Kamala adding to the ticket kind of increase some enthusiasm within young black voters for sure. Well, Marquise, uh, Joe Biden has talked about Black Lives Matter and, and those issues. And here, here's a clip of him uh, talking about that recently. Let's take a listen. We say we have no need to face racial injustice in this country. You haven't opened your eyes to the truth of America today. There have been powerful voices for justice in recent weeks and months. George Floyd's six-year-old daughter who I met with and when I met the family, Gina, I knelt down to say hi to her and she said, looked at me and said, Daddy, change the world. Jacob Blake's mother, another one, when I met with her, said, violence doesn't reflect who her son is and the nation needs healing and said she's playing, praying for the police officers. Or Doc Rivers, the basketball coach, choking back tears when he said, quote, we're the ones getting killed. We're the ones getting shot. We've been hung. It's amazing why we keep loving this country and this country doesn't love us back. Think about that. Think about what it takes to be a black person to love America today. That is a deep love of this country that is far too long has not been fully recognized. And I guess we could, you know, kind of analyze how authentic that is or not. I mean, all politicians try to get their message across. But Marquise, you brought up Kamala Harris, and, and I wanted to sort of ask about that. You saw that big Kamala sign, it was Joe and Kamala, sort of equal billing, actually interesting. And how much is she going to really resonate with the black community? You touched on that. Maybe you can drill down a little bit more. Yeah, I think I think Kamala is is honestly what Joe Biden needed. You know, a lot of people have had conversations, you know, about Joe's age. And, you know, we also know he has, I believe, a speech impediment. But when you look at Kamala and her debate style, I mean, she gets right through the teeth of things. I think she held her own when it came to VP uh, Pence. And they, we cannot discount what it means, the fact that we have an HBCU alum on this national ticket. HBCUs have been the pride and joy for a lot of Black America for so long. Before Black people could go to any school in the country, they had to go to our own schools. And they, they have, so they continue to 
be a part of just the black community and the black experience, whether that be fraternities and sororities. And once again, Kamala Harris being a part of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. And they are a huge international organization full of hundreds of thousands of women. So they're able to mobilize. And honestly, once again, with the snafus that Joe Biden seems to have almost seemingly every few weeks, Kamala seems to be the person there to kind of pick up the pieces in many ways. And I have to also point out that video you showed. When we think about even COVID-19, obviously, we're in this international, this worldwide pandemic, and we see the crowds that the president Trump has versus Biden having this campaign rally where there's cars socially distanced and you hear cars honking in the background. And we know that COVID-19 disproportionately affects the black community. I think it goes a long way in showing where the our you know our potential president for 2020 where their head is about how they care about the black community. All right, really interesting stuff. Thanks, Marquise. Thank you. Up next, we'll be joined by HuffPost reporter Jahan Jones to talk about race relations under President Trump. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Joining us now is HuffPost reporter Jahan Jones. Jahan, welcome. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. You recently took a look back at how President Trump often turns to racist language when he feels threatened, going all the way back to the 1980s. Tell us about that and the impact on black communities. Sure. So I wrote that piece just to convey that this is in Trump, a person who has continually shown an eagerness to draw from the well of white supremacy, you know, throughout the entirety of his professional career and certainly well into his political career. Um, early in his professional career, uh, you might be aware that he was accused of uh, housing discrimination, not allowing black uh, renters to stay in his spaces. And then uh, even more recently than that, when he was when he took out the ad uh, condemning what was then called the uh, Central Park Five, he uh, put out that ad during a time when he was experiencing uh, effectively financial calamity. And he resorted to that as a means to heighten his profile, uh, up his credibility. And so the point of that piece was just to convey that he's deploying a similar strategy with his political campaign. Obviously, at this time, uh, the pandemic is ravaging the country, but he's continued to kind of tap that well of white supremacy. And the unfortunate thing for him is that we're living at a time of actual scarcity. Uh, the pandemic has made that glaringly obvious. 
and scarcity doesn't really comply with the promises of white supremacy, which is that every white man can have access to the American dream. You can be, you can live a middle class life. You can uh, acquire a, a, a refined education. All of those promises are becoming less and less realistic. All the while, Trump is leaning more heavily into that kind of rhetoric. So I think that's where you see some of the suburban white people have kind of cleaved from his support because not necessarily because of his rhetoric, but because some of the promises that might have been afforded to people through white supremacy and white nationalism in the past are just becoming less and less realistic as a result of this pandemic that he cannot uh, he cannot corral. So Trump has said he's done more for the black community than any president since Abraham Lincoln. Uh, no, I know yes. I, 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 know you, I know you don't agree with that. Uh, but can you just, you know, can you talk a little bit? I mean, has he been, uh, what do you think? Has he been the worst president for the black community since Abraham Lincoln? And, you know, sort of what, you know, what is, what is he doing when he's saying like, when he's saying this, you know, what is his strategy here? Because uh, his, his campaign is cynically trying to make overtures, I think, to black voters. Uh, you know, sort of what is, what is he doing here? Sure. I think to your point, there's a question as to whether those are really overtures to black voters or whether they're demonstrations to white people that he's not as racist as others might think. Um, I always think back to in 2016 when Trump revealed his black platform uh, on the uh, tabloid media takeout. I thought that's kind of a I thought of that as kind of a, a great exemplification of his the seriousness with which he takes black issues that he would release it in this kind of haphazard way. Uh, through a tabloid, that's where he thinks he's meeting black people. And I think as since then, you've seen this very uh, unserious approach to garnering the black vote. I mean, I don't know which rapper uh, the Trump campaign is going to partner with next to kind of convey its message. But the reality is that black people aren't going to be tricked into voting for a man who in some very overt ways has made clear he doesn't want black people to vote. In 2016, he told black people they have nothing to lose by staying home. In 2020, uh, he is deploying up upwards of $20 billion in lawsuits across the country um, to make voting more difficult, particularly in black areas. So all of these overtures he's making, again, you have to wonder whether he's making those to black people uh, or whether he's making those to white people who want to feel as though they're uh, supporting a man who's not as racist as everyone believes him to be. Uh, Jahan, if there's a silver lining um, to this very difficult period um, that we've uh, been living through over the last um, uh, six or eight months, um, it's that, uh, you know, in some ways for all the wrong reasons, um, the country has come together um, to um, really focus on inequities, on social justice issues, um, to to what extent um, do you think uh, people in the in the black community are concerned or should be concerned that if Joe Biden is elected, um, that some of the energy uh, goes out of that um, that movement um, because there's a sense that well you know now we have a, a Democrat who's committed to these issues a little bit of of you know I think about mm -hmm. what happened when Barack o Obama was elected um, that a lot yes. of people could say a lot of people could say um, you know. Uh, we've elected a black president um, and it's the, the end of racism. Um, and yes. uh, it clearly, it clearly wasn't. So is there concern in the black community about that? Yes. And I actually don't think that concern is uh, tied at all to Joe Biden winning. I, I saw a survey fairly recently that said a lot of the gains that were achieved as a result of the George Floyd protest with regard to anti-racist advocacy have regressed, meaning uh, the support for black lives matter that we saw uh, so heavily in the immediate wake of uh, of George Floyd's death has kind of uh, dissipated in the time since. So I think that concern about apathy toward racism is just this ever present concern that looms over black people. Certainly uh, there's concern among more progressive black people that if a Democrat is elected, the people who uh, live in a society who have been experiencing Trump for the last four years would believe that that was some sort of accomplishment and kind of take their foot off the gas. But I think the circumstances right now are so dire that once Joe Biden is elected, there's going to be so much work to be done <clears throat> for years to come that he won't be allowed to 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 rest on his laurels, so to speak. Mm -hmm. 
All right, Jahan Jones, thank you so much for that insight. I appreciate you. Up next, Yahoo Finance reporter Sabil Marcellus on the coronavirus recession and how it's <clears throat> impacting communities of color. Welcome back. Joining us now is Yahoo Finance reporter Sabil Marcellus. Hey, Sabil. Hey, Andy. How's it going? Good. Thanks for joining us. You've been reporting on the push for more government stimulus and the recession. How is this different than economic downturns of years past? Well, we're seeing specifically when it comes to black workers they're being disproportionately impacted by the coronavirus pandemic. Not just from a health point, they're being impacted there too, but also from a workplace standpoint. They're more likely to be exposed to coronavirus, more likely to also lose their jobs as a result of the pandemic. And as we know, many workers, once they lose their jobs, they also lose their health care coverage. So I've been taking a close look at the unemployment rate. We've seen it come down to 7.9% in September. When you look at the unemployment rate for minorities, it remains elevated in the double digits. So we're seeing there's still a lot that needs to be addressed in terms of really supporting the black community as we undergo this pandemic. Now, this is not to say that there weren't issues in the workplace in corporate America prior to the pandemic, but we've only seen it got, get a lot worse as a result of the pandemic. Uh, Sabil, I, I wonder, um how, um, to, to what extent um, Congress considers uh, racial inequities when it um, crafts uh, stimulus legislation like this? I mean, John, John F. Kennedy uh, said that uh, rising tide lifts all boats. Um, and so I guess, I guess the question is, um, do we have to and has the Congress been more race conscious uh, when putting together legislation. I, I think about some of the disparities in just receiving, um, you know, stimulus uh, uh, help. I mean, there are a lot of people in the uh, in community, communities of color that are unbanked, um, and so they don't have direct deposit, for example. Uh, you know, if their earnings uh, are, at, you know, fairly low, they don't file for taxes, which means that they have to find, you know, do other paperwork. Um, I just wanted, wondered how much those kinds of issues are taken into account. 
That's a really important question, Dan, Dan, and that's something that lawmakers really have to address because we're seeing Washington, when they're dealing with the coronavirus pandemic, they're taking a one-size-fits-all approach. So obviously they're doing the Paycheck Protection Program, small business loans to help all Americans who are being impacted by the pandemic. But the question is, how do you help minority businesses that are facing possibly more severe impacts because Prior to the pandemic, it was much harder for them when you look at the data to even secure a loan to launch a small business. So the few that were able to do it, those numbers, now to be hit with the coronavirus pandemic. And then when we're looking at who was able to secure one of those Paycheck Protection Program loans, when you look at the data, you see that minority businesses were challenged in being able to secure those loans. So because of that, many of them had to close shop permanently. And for those that were able to secure a loan, they're actually grouped in with actually all small businesses that are impacted because they need another round of loans. They're asking for more help. So when it comes to addressing specifically racial equity in stimulus financial relief for the entire country, we're seeing lawmakers basically focus on everybody, but we're seeing a difference when it comes to Joe Biden's campaign. So I just spoke uh, not too long ago with the chief of staff of Kamala Harris, Karine Jean-Pierre. And what she was saying is that Biden, in his administration, he would take a different approach where he would look at systemic racism and have that color their perspectives and their actions when it comes to legislation. So if they're able to accomplish that in the Biden administration, if Joe Biden were to be elected, then we could possibly see a different approach from Washington when it comes to offering financial relief and addressing different issues in the workplace for Americans and for minorities. Sabil, you mentioned that you spoke with Karine Jean-Pierre recently um, about stimulus and um, more, more specifically Kamala Harris and the campaign. So we have a, a clip of that. So let's go and listen to that right now. Look, we have to meet this moment. And that's what Joe Biden and Kamala Harris believe in, is meeting the moment and um, actually engaging uh, the black community and having that real conversation that's needed to be had. Joe Biden says this all the time. You know, this is we're talking about systemic racism and it affects and it permeates throughout uh, our society, throughout um you know, throughout uh, everything, right? Whether it's healthcare, as we're seeing over and over again. And look, so yes, we have to figure out um, how we deal with criminal justice reform. We also have to figure out as well how how systemic racism deals in every part, every way. Sabil, so how do you think that message, how well do you think that message is resonating uh, with black voters? So when Biden was doing his search for a vice presidential candidate, he said that it was going to be a woman. But uh, although Kamala Harris was a front runner, the question was, well, she was her state's top cop as district attorney for San Francisco. Now, we've seen the protests of recent months. Would she really be the right person to really address social justice issues. And we're seeing that obviously Biden picked her. Uh, she made history as his vice presidential pick. And moving forward, we're going to have to see, obviously, the campaign is going to make a lot of promises, as do all campaigns trying to win. But we're going to see the difference, really, if they get the chance, if Americans give them the chance to be in the White House, how they would address these issues differently. And so we've talked about the political world, but how is the corporate world and workplaces, how are they responding to these Black Lives Matter protests, these racial equality protests? You know, I see lots of nice ads saying that they support uh, racial justice, but are, is the corporate world and our workplaces actually making meaningful, lasting changes to address systemic racism? So we saw as a result of the protest following the death of George Floyd, corporate America have this uh, moment where they really, it seems like their eyes were opened up and they really wanted to help their black workers. So we saw a lot of promises about diversity in the workplace and promotions for black workers and more hiring of black workers and more training. And we heard those promises, but at this point, we're holding them accountable. So Americans are watching what companies promised what 
and what have they actually de delivered? And that really comes to those who are at the top of the companies. You can't expect a black worker who maybe is at the bottom of the ladder to really be able to implement mm -hmm change across the company. So we're really focusing on uh, when it comes to Americans looking at these companies and their promises at, you know, what's happening in the heat suite, what's happening with the CEOs, the people who actually are in charge and can affect change. Are they actually doing it? And uh, we're seeing some actually fall in hot water just trying to meet those diversity goals. Uh, I wrote a story recently about Wells Fargo's CEO. And what he was trying to do is over the summer, uh, in June, he made some comments that were considered controversial by some employees within his company, some black workers, uh, because he was saying there was a limited black talent pool, uh, which is can be very offensive to black workers who feel like they have the talent. And the issue is not a question of talent, but a question of opportunity. Um, I also spoke to a Brookings Institution expert who said that uh, there's this tired narrative out there uh, when black workers are seeking opportunities to say, oh, well, there's a skill gap, you know, go train go get more skills. And what this Brookings Institution report is saying is that there's actually an opportunity gap. And it's important for uh, CEOs and the C-suite to really address the opportunity gap to really help uh, black workers and minority workers. All right. Great stuff. Thanks so much for joining us, Sabeel. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Andy. Straight ahead, DeRay McKesson, one of the most prominent leaders of the Black Lives Matters movement. He joins us next. All right, we're delighted now to be joined by DeRay McKesson. DeRay has been a central player in the Black Lives Matter movement since he left his job in the Minneapolis public school system and moved to St. Louis to work for change in Ferguson following the death of Michael Brown. DeRay, great to see you. It's good to see you too. It's been a while. It has. So let me start off by asking you just how energized you think African Americans are when it comes to voting uh, in the election this year, and to what extent they're going to vote for Joe Biden, and to what extent are some of them going to vote for Donald Trump? Yeah, so I think that there are a lot of people who know exactly what's at stake, that we have barely survived these last four years of what's going on under Trump, and that we want to make sure that these next four years are ones that we 
don't just survive, but that we thrive in. Now, it is disconcerting. There are about 18 percent of black men under the age of 50 that do support Trump, which has been shocking. I talked to a pollster about it yesterday. And what he said that I thought was really interesting. He was like, for this subgroup of people, uh, Trump's racism alone is not actually a disqualifier because they would say the whole system's racist. But it's the impact of his racism that's actually a disqualifier. So it's the impact. It's like it's like telling uh, people about the ca- the kids in cages and seeking the death penalty for drug dealers. All those things actually become a disqualifier for Trump. Uh, so telling that story, especially as we get down, and you know, I think that what Trump has done effectively to the left is he actually isn't even attacking Biden all that much in his ads. He's actually attacking the party. He's saying the party's corrupt. The party doesn't care about you. Why are people believing him? I don't know, uh, but it, it unfortunately is effective. So, DeRay, I wanted to talk to you about um, some of the down ballot races and sort of what the racial justice protests, you know, what room you think that they have given uh, black candidates to run. There are six black Senate candidates this cycle, five on the Democratic side, one on the Republican side. Um, A lot of them are long shots, but some of them are getting quite a bit of attention. Jamie Harrison in South Carolina, uh, the Reverend Raphael Warnock (laughs) in Georgia. Warnock's doing Um, well. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you know, Harrison, Harrison and Graham are very close right now. And I talked to Mike Espy in Mississippi, who obviously ran before. And he said, he, and last time he ran, he was, uh, he took some heat because uh, political commentators noted that he wasn't really talking about race. Uh, I talked to him this time and he said that he is talking about race. He's telling his story because he felt like last time he couldn't connect with younger voters without talking about the discrimination he faced, the segregation in schools, um, and that this time is just different. Um, So how do you think that the racial justice movements have created more room for black candidates to run? And how is how is this different than, say, 2016 and, and sort of the political discussions about race? Yeah, I think about in 2014, it was still a newer conversation to be had in public at the national level. That in 2014, I even think about the police. It was like, you know, people thought we were the wild kids for being like, the police shouldn't kill people. I mean, that was like a radical thing that we said out in the street. And it took people a lot of time to like learn and listen and read. By the time the protests reemerged, this time people were ready. People were like, okay, got it. There's a problem. Let me know what I can do. That, that it wasn't a jarring idea, that the idea of activism wasn't new. You know, after Ferguson comes, the Women's March comes, the March for Our Lives kid, like activism starts to become sort of just like a part of the culture. It wasn't the case in 2014. It was still, we were still the fringe kids. Uh, And I think that that's actually really powerful. I think that Cori Bush in St. Louis, I think that there are a host of candidates who, if not for the, like this moment was like a galvanizing thing that like made people put their values at the ballot box. And I think that we will continue to benefit from that. You know, what's hard is that like, it's not, it won't be enough just to win the presidency. We will have to win the Senate, like gotta win it. So I'm hoping that we will get a wave of votes like we did in the midterms or like the Dems knocked it out of the park, hoping that that'll happen again. And you're right. There are six black candidates. John James has got to lose (laughs) the one Republican candidate. There's an interview he just did where he's like, he doesn't even know the answer to the question about health care. Uh, he is not a friend of uh, issues related to Black people, and I am hoping that the guy running against him wins. Uh, Ray, DeRay, you're, you're talking ahead, about um, yeah, you're talking about uh, 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 Blacks running for elective office, um, but I want to ask you about should Joe Biden win um, uh, the presidency? I wonder if you think that um, there ought to be more representation from the sort of activist community uh, in his administ- in his administration. You know, there will be a lot of talk about uh, the cabinet that he puts together, and Democrats have been more committed, I think, to racial diversity in their administrations than Republicans have traditionally. Uh, but but I'm I'm interested specifically um, in in the activist community. If if people like yourself, for example, would think that there may be an opportunity to uh, bring reform from within. Um, as opposed to staying outside of the the administration. I mean, is this something that you would consider, for example? Yeah, I don't know if that's where I'd best be suited, but there should be organizers, there should be activists who are on the inside. That Part of our work is to make sure that we're not always fighting the people on the inside, that we're actually, we are the people on the inside. I think the cabinet will be huge. I think that the cleanup after Trump will not only be massive, but it'll allow people's sense of possibility will be more expansive because this one, this has been such a nightmare that I'm hoping that the next set of people come in, that they do the most aggressive things in the first 100 days, right? That that actually is like 
part of the strategy. So I'm hopeful about that. I also am mindful that the power to vote is three things, right? It's the power to hire, fire, and shape. So hiring is like get the right person in, firing is get the get the wrong people out. Uh, but the third bucket is like get enough of, pe- of enough of the people who share our values in the room so that we're always represented. Hey, Dore, I remember you told me um, that in 2016, I believe you were supporting Bernie Sanders and he lost and Hillary got the nomination. And you said a lot of your friends um, said, I can't believe you're supporting Hillary, Dore. Um, you know, you're you're betraying the cause. And then you said, well, Donald Trump means it. Now, similar thing has sort of transpired this time. Maybe you were supporting Bernie to someone else. Biden gets the nod. Are you getting the same pushback from some of your friends who criticized you before for supporting Hillary when you're supporting Biden this time? No, it's different. You know, I think about even running for office in 2016, people were like, activists shouldn't run for office. You're a sellout for wanting to do it. Like now it's like, you know, you look at AOC, you look at so many people, people people have understood that we got to be on the inside. I think the pushback this time is I think that people are struggling with some of Biden's statements about the police. I think that people are people sort of take this phase as being like the end all be all. Whereas I'm like, you know what? People put out campaign plans and then they get in the office and we have so much room to push them. But that's a part of the way the work the the that's a part of the way that the work works. That Biden won't be every position, right? He will be the person sort of outlining a framework, and then there'll be a host of people in the administration who make it happen. And there'll probably be almost no holdovers from the Trump administration. So when I'm looking at this, I'm playing the long game. We have a lot of room to press. The attorney general will matter. The special assistants will matter. The cabinet, you know, like it'll be, we have a lot of people to influence. It's not just Biden. And that's how I've always thought about this. So I do see some people saying, well, I I see some people who don't know the terror that Trump has inflicted on people. And then I also see some people who sort of feed into the Republican narrative of like, they just want to arrest everybody. They just want to lock everybody up. And that's actually like a Trump narrative. All right. Well, DeRay McKesson, so great to see you. Best of luck to you going forward. Great to see y'all. We'll be right back with some final thoughts from our panel. All right, welcome back. Before we go, Dan and Amanda, any final thoughts from you on the final two weeks of the election? What are we looking for here? Oh my God, I don't know what's gonna happen in the final two weeks. Um, (laughs) You know, I didn't expect the president to get coronavirus. Um, You know, I think that the focus 
barring anything really weird, is going to continue to be on the coronavirus. You know, Trump, again, has tried to change the topic several times. Uh, He tried to make it about crime. He tried to make it about China. um, And he tried to make it about the Supreme Court. None of those have really caught on. People are still focused on the coronavirus, on their economic well-being. And that is where it's going to stay as of now. Dan, do you agree? And how important is the debate, for instance, coming up this week? You know, typically uh, the the last debate is the least important. Uh, now there there was only one other this time around, um, which I think was actually more consequential than uh, debates tend to be, largely because uh, Donald Trump um, uh, did, I think, fairly disastrously um, and uh, did not uh, do anything at all to kind of. Um, you know, bring a kind of closing argument uh, to this campaign. It, the, if the question is, uh, you know, what's going to happen over the next two weeks, one thing I can, I think, say fairly confidently is everyone's going to be freaking out over the next two weeks. I think Republican voters are going to be freaking out because they, they're looking at the numbers and it is looking like a potential um, uh, landslide and Democratic voters uh, will be those who are really paying co- close attention. That is, will be freaking out because they will. There will be some tightening. There will be outlier polls that show it's closer than they realize. They'll be thinking about what happened in 2016, um, and um, no one is going to be uh, resting um, comfortably between now and November 3rd. Amanda, quick last uh, question over to you. So you remember four years ago at this time? Do we remember? Did it really seem like? Hillary Clinton had this thing in the bag. And is that the same sort of level that we have now with Joe Biden? And we were wrong. Right. I mean, but also, you know, what was it, 10 days out from the election, you had the James Comey bombshell. So again, anything could happen in these last two weeks. And you see Republicans desperately trying to throw out whatever they can on Hunter Biden. I don't know if there's going to be some bombshell. Right now, it's not catching on. But remember, too, the election is really perhaps only going to be the beginning of what could be a protracted uh, court battle and counting and sort of waiting for these ballots to come in as both sides contest it. All right, Amanda Turkel and Dan Kleiman, thanks very much. Thanks, Andy. And thank you all for watching. This is the last of these specials before Election Day, but stay tuned to Yahoo News, HuffPost, and Yahoo Finance every day between now and November 3rd for continuous coverage. And don't forget to tune in on Monday, October 26th for Yahoo Finance's All Market Summit.